everyone. Welcome to ESG Decoded. Happy New Year. It's 2023. We're really excited to be back. And uh, this week I have with me Simon Fishweiker of CDP and Emily Damon of Clydeco. I am really excited about this conversation because we're going to be talking a lot about um, supply chains and the value chain um, and decarbonization of that space, which of course is the whole world, essentially. <laughs> It's a very big topic, but Emily and Simon are going to help us break it down. Welcome to the podcast, Simon and Emily. Thank, Thank you for you having me. So just briefly, Emily, obviously we work together. You're the Senior Vice President for Sustainability Policy Advisory, which is our consulting group at Climco, and Simon for context as well. Simon, you are the Head of Corporations and Supply Chains for CDP North America. So I think our audience knows who Climco is. Let's focus on CDP. Tell us about your organization, Simon, and what you guys do, and then a little bit more about your job. Yeah, my pleasure. And, and thank you again, Caitlin, for inviting me to join this conversation. Really looking forward to, to speaking with you and Emily. Sustainable supply chains is what I spend 24-7 uh, on. CDP is an environmental nonprofit organization. We were started over 20 years ago with the concept that at the time was revolutionary that you could get the capital markets to use the power, the power of finance and, and shareholder action essentially to drive companies to disclose environmental impacts, particularly on climate change. And, and today that idea has become more mainstream. And the concept is essentially that CDP is providing a environmental disclosure system for in 2022 nearly 20,000 companies to measure, manage, and report climate change, deforestation, and water security information to their investors and also their customers. So again, the idea started with the capital markets driving disclosure primarily from publicly traded companies, but has expanded to other financial interactions, using those interactions to drive companies or, 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 or other organizations to report their environmental information. And so over 10 years ago, we actually were approached by some of the companies that were disclosing information to their investors who said, we really want to do this. We really want to provide accurate disclosure to our investors so they can understand how we are performing on climate change. They can see that we are transparent. We're managing these risks and opportunities. But we've recognized our greatest impact is in our supply chain. Can you replicate this process for our supply chain, essentially run the CDP disclosure system for our suppliers? And so in addition to 680 institutional investors who are requesting CDP uh, disclosure from, from companies they are invested in, we now have nearly 300 companies who are part of our supply chain program requesting that their suppliers disclose through CDP. And that's actually been one of the biggest uh, drivers of, of reporting uh, growth over the last uh, several years. So that's a bit about CDP and a, maybe a little bit of a foreshadowing for some of the context I could bring to the conversation today. Yeah, thank you for that background, Simon. I also like to remind folks just because it's it's one of my my pet peeves is when people still spell out carbon disclosure project. It is not Carbon Disclosure Project anymore. You officially changed your name to CDP years and years and years ago. So for folks that are listening um, as part of their education for getting into the ESG space, um, yes, it's no longer Carbon Disclosure Project. <laughs> that, that, that is correct. And I think, you know, sometimes it's a bit of a weird thing to explain CDP. You know, we don't stand for Carbon Disclosure Project anymore. Uh, you know, why is that? We've expanded beyond carbon, and so when we brought in forest and water, and that's actually a theme. I know we won't talk about it too much today, but but for CDP to expand, expand to other planetary boundaries, understanding that solving the climate crisis means saving nature as well, right? Protecting nature, and so that's that's our water, that's our forest, it's biodiversity, it's our ocean. So that that's sort of where CDP is headed, and and why we aren't carbon disclosure project anymore. Well, you know, we brought the two of you together. Because Simon, you work, obviously, live and breathe supply chains. And Emily, in our consulting practice, has done a lot of really interesting work in helping connect the dots in supply chains. So we're hoping this is a great conversation really between two experts in this space. And I thought it might be helpful um, just to start with 
perhaps a concrete example so folks can wrap their heads around what CDP, what do you actually do as a company when you decide to report to CDP? What is the process? And just a just a very brief overview. And then, you know, how has reporting to CDP, perhaps from your perspective, Simon, or from yours, Emily, as supporting companies in this, led to companies making different decisions? So I think, you know, well, where I'll take this is sort of a little bit of the process and in the journey we see companies take overall and, and maybe some of how that gets used on the company side and, and potentially a little bit on on the data user side. But, you know, I'd be really interested to hear from Emily on, on sort of working with those individual companies as they're going through that, because we often see it from a more macro perspective across tens of thousands of organizations. But, you know, essentially companies are, for the most part, come into the world of CDP because they are requested to do so. Uh, either from institutional investors re receiving pressure uh, to report because they're a publicly traded company, or if they're operating in the private markets, perhaps lending or other financing activity, and, and the f institutional investor or, or bank or, or financier is seeking information to bring into due diligence or, or understand sort of climate impacts. And so the way in which a company may come in the other being directly requested by one of their customers as part of our supply chain program. Essentially, companies have a publicly available questionnaire, guidance, document, and scoring methodology that indicate what are the questions that uh, it's pertinent for them to be reporting on. And when it comes to climate change, how to actually go about understanding what those questions mean. What is scope to location-based versus market-based emissions? What are the 15 categories of of uh, scope three emissions and how those uh, responses are going to be scored. And that scoring really is uh, oriented at driving robust disclosure and best practice across categories like governance, risk management, strategy, metrics, targets, value chain engagement. And so a company each year will collect that data, submit that data, receive a score back, and then the information will also go to the respective stakeholders who are interested in, in seeking the information. Also, around 60% of the companies that, that disclose overall uh, submit a, a public response. And, and so then those companies submit a public response. The information is also accessible on the CDP website to academia, to others who may want to use that data for their own uh, ESG uh, assessments of, of companies. Uh, and so it really fuels an ecosystem of, of, of climate information. Uh, and then, you know, rinse and repeat. Essentially, each year the company takes that information and builds upon it. The beauty of that is that, that over time, they don't have to recreate the wheel each time they are reporting. The questionnaire is set. It's going to be comparable and standardized across the tens of thousands of other companies also reporting. Over time, it does change in terms of incorporating new topics like transition plans. Uh, it's just an emerging issue or increasing the ambition in terms of what is expected to be a leader. But for the most part, it stays consistent, allowing companies to build on their success through their measurement, actually demonstrate management of climate issues uh, and, and improve over time. And, and we've seen that actually successfully happen where companies who are reporting see, uh, you know, we're seeing increased amount of target setting or emission reporting uh, in the subsequent years after their first response. Over to you, Emily. Well, let's see. What to add to that? I suppose... The companies that Climco supports and, you know, over the course of my career helping companies navigate the CDP ecosystem, I see a lot of those steps taking place that Simon just described. So that are often receiving a request, sometimes multiple requests, and then they approach the questionnaire. Perhaps at this point, our sort of view diverges. So Simon shared a number of elements about the questionnaire, that it's um, been fairly consistent across various disclosing companies. Um, it has evolved through the years, but you know, doesn't radically change from one year to the next. But for many companies, especially those approaching CDP for the first time, they open up the questionnaire and they see, holy smugs, there is there are 16 modules or more. There are, you know, over a hundred questions. And that I think can be sometimes the first reaction to CDP is, wow, this is lengthy. This is going to be a big undertaking on top of, you know, the client specific requests I'm getting on ESG, the investor calls I'm getting, all of the other things that are piling up. And um, sometimes CDP could be seen as, you know, just another request. What I often try to help 
our clients understand is that the ubiquitousness of CDP as a tool really makes it valuable to them and worth their time to invest in. I think one thing we'll try to illuminate today in our conversation is that the transparency that CDP provides and the platform that it provides is really useful for data, for information at this point. Um, but the ultimate intent is to create transformation, to be a an enabler for there to be incentives and action on decarbonization. So more to come on how that happens, but we definitely help companies go from the initial perhaps shock of seeing a lengthy questionnaire to understanding how they really use it as a tool. There's no doubt that it is a robust questionnaire. Um, and we certainly hear that same sort of input and feedback when companies are first reporting. What I do uh, also hear that I think is, is, is a positive is while it's a, it's a pretty robust wheel, it's a wheel that's already created. So you don't need to recreate the wheel when thinking about how do I report on climate change to my stakeholders? Here's something that exists. Here's something that's seen as best practice. And, and what we try to persuade companies is you may not have everything at the start. And when you look at this robust questionnaire, it may be intimidating, but you've got to get started. And here's something that you can build on each year. Here's a framework that, that allows for the conversation. But anyway, Caitlin, I know we want to get into the supply chain side of things, so I'll, I'll, I'll cut myself off there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I think that's it's always just helpful to start with some concrete, you know, so folks understand exactly how companies use it. The other thing I wanted to just point out, if it wasn't clear earlier, is that who's buying and using the data from CDP is at least, in, correct me if I'm wrong, Simon, it's mostly investors, right? Is there another group that tends to be a purchaser of the data? Yeah, I would say there's sort of three okay. groups, right? So we have the individual financial institutions that are signatory to the CDP disclosure request, um, and they license the data, but it's it, it is at a significant discount because those uh, financial institutions are also putting their assets under management and their name behind the CDP disclosure request so that when I go out and talk to a company in the energy sector, perhaps, who's never disclosed, I can indicate, you know, the New York State Common Retirement Fund is supporting this request and they're, you know, a shareholder of yours, right? Um, the other group is the supply chain members, so the companies requesting their suppliers, and they have access to, you know, limited data in that it's only their supplier submissions. But then there's a, another group that that are sort of not part of the direct CDP request, but may license the data for other purposes. And so, you know, the likes of uh, MSCI or, or ISS that are producing their own sort of ESG ratings and rankings may license the CDP data. Academic institutions that are looking to do research may license CDP data. And so other entities who are sort of using that data for other purposes may also use the information and policymakers. You know, I, I don't think this will be the focus of, of the conversation today necessarily, but you know, the, the elephant in the room in the United States in any climate conversation at the moment is the proposed SEC rule on climate disclosure. And as the SEC was pulling together what the components of that rule would include, there was significant use of CDP data to understand what companies were already doing. Right. And so that transparency provides many different actors in our in our global economy information to to, to drive decision making. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think decision making, you know, it's a good segue to just remind folks that the whole purpose of this is accelerating decarbonization across the value chain, right? So that's a, a great segue into this this more specific conversation about supply chains and about value chains more broadly. So why don't we start a little bit with Simon? I mean, this is what you live and breathe day to day, a little bit about how um, CDP is helping to facilitate decarbonization across value chains. And then hand it over to Emily after that um, for more um, of her thoughts, because I know you've been working on a lot of this as well, Emily. Great. And the value chain decarbonization is some of the most exciting work to me because what it embodies is the necessary collaboration that is required across sectors, across competitors, across customers and suppliers to actually decarbonize our economy. No one company can achieve 
science-based climate goals within their company walls, right? So we need to engage our peers, we need to engage our customers, we need to engage our suppliers. The supply chain opportunities are enormous. So on one hand, there's the importance of collecting information from your supply chain to address scope three emissions, those uh, emissions that are sort of indirect, right? Scope one being sort of your direct emissions from you know combustion of fossil fuels potentially driving your fleet. Uh, scope two from electricity use that's indirect, but it's from your direct use of electricity and scope three sort of everything else, right? The use of your product, your supply chain emissions. And we focus a lot on supply chain emissions because there are real opportunities to engage suppliers and work across a value chain to reduce those emissions. And the effects have an enormous opportunity to cascade climate ambition. So if you have a large retailer who is interested in, in decarbonization, they have the power to not only collect data, but sort of transport their ambition when it comes to climate change all the way down their supply chain, getting their tier one suppliers to engage on climate and, and sort of move their ambition forward. And that sort of travels down the, the supply chain. And so what CDP really tries to do is use our disclosure platform or questionnaire as a tool to facilitate that, right? So you, you have one company who's pushed into CDP disclosure by the investment community and, and over time is demonstrating improvement. They start to recognize that to set the most ambitious target for their emission reductions, they're going to need to address scope three emissions. They're going to need to look across their value chain emissions. Uh, and the only way to do that is to actually engage their suppliers. You can't just estimate those emissions and reduce them through estimations because the only way to reduce those emissions would be stop buying things. Um, to actually reduce those emissions, you need to engage your suppliers and have those suppliers go through that same process of calculating, measuring, managing, and disclosing their emissions. And in many cases, what you find is those companies actually need to engage their own suppliers. And so you end up with this cascading climate action that makes it down to the producer level for individual commodities, which is which is really exciting because in the end, that's in some ways the only way that companies at the beginning of many value chains will be exposed to requests around climate action. So the opportunities are, are, are really fantastic when it comes to value chain engagement. But Emily, I'd, I'd love to hear from your perspective, you know, working with individual companies on on this uh, issue, we tend to get a bit of a macro perspective at CDP. So, so curious on your experience and also, you know, glad to dig in. I, I went pretty broad there, glad to dig in anywhere that, that is something piqued your interest. Yeah, I love it, Simon. I'd pick up on those requests. I've seen them trickling back through the value chain. The clients that I was working with primarily uh, 10 years ago, were mostly consumer facing brands and mostly those companies who had received, you know, direct knock on the door from an investor to respond to CDP. And now the list of clients who I get to work with is all the way across the value chain. I still work with those consumer facing brands, but I also work with, you know, the manufacturers, with the logistics companies, with the extractives, with the fuel producers, everything that kind of rolls up into the final embodied carbon in a you know, a bottle of juice or, or a vehicle, let's say. I think one thing that I, you know, one thing I see a lot today is that a lot of the focus and communication and engagement between suppliers and customers is around data and transparency. And I think we alluded to earlier the, the CDP's vision of going from transparency to transformation. Um, and I think that that's what I see as coming next, where you know, we have to do a lot of hard work to get the bean counting right, to get the numbers, get a grasp of where impacts are happening. And I think it can be easy to become mired in that. But you and I, I think, both see and both continue to push on this front because we know that this is the tool that enables the transformation we all want to see. Couldn't agree more. And for the last five, 10 years, I think the focus has been on the bean counting, right? And getting companies to actually count their beans just getting companies to report their emissions. And then once they've reported their scope one and two emissions, getting companies to understand that scope three emissions were important and that they did have, even though those weren't direct emissions, some sense of responsibility for those emissions and should measure them and set targets for them. But now we're getting to a point where what excites people in the field the most, which is the actual transformation, the transition plans, the decarbonization, 
we built the momentum behind the the bean counting that that I think we're starting to have more of those conversations with companies. One example at CDP at the moment is we've been piloting some work with some of our more ambitious supply chain members who have set their own transition plans. And a transition plan essentially being not just their their target, not just their net zero and science-based target to reduce emissions in line with climate science, but the actual plan to get there, right? What's the governance structure behind how they're going to achieve that target? What are the products and services they're going to be investing in? How will they engage their customers and their, and their suppliers as part of that journey? And what scenarios are they looking at, right? The scenario analysis, what, what sort of climate scenarios are they looking at to understand what their business could look like in the future and how they get there? And, and some of the companies who've already set those plans are actually now going to their suppliers and saying, Yes, we want you to disclose scope one and two emissions, but we also want to hear about your transition plan because when we're looking at different scenarios, different value chain impacts that climate change may happen on commodities and that we were reliant on or, or manufacturing facilities we know you have in different areas of the world that have climate risk, we're recognizing that we can't transition if our suppliers aren't transitioning, right? So that same mentality that we can't disclose our emissions appropriately and reduce those without our suppliers doing the same is now being applied to the idea of business model transformation. And that's really exciting because what that leads to is value chain level transformation. And, you know, that's really what we need. So here's a question for you, Simon, if I can ask one, Caitlin. So it seems like there's been this evolution of first, it starts with sort of a check the box exercise. I ask my suppliers to give me their data. And if they're doing so, that's a good thing. It's evolved now to they give me their data and I actually use it to quantify my scope three emissions more accurately. Then Simon, what you just alluded to, okay, now as a customer, I may start pushing my suppliers to have a plan to tell me what they're doing to decarbonize. I think since we get to work on behalf of a lot of companies who are heavy emitters, who are kind of these focal points where decarbonization is really possible, where it's economically feasible. The missing piece or what I think has to come next is, okay, you're asking me for data, you're using it to make calculations, you're asking me for my plan, and yeah, I can decarbonize in 10 different ways. I've done my marginal abatement cost curve. Some of these decarbonization actions may save me money and I better be underway on those, but there will be some that require investment that that carry a cost. And so how is the incentive for decarbonization going to trickle through the value chain? Like, where, where are the dollars per ton reduction going to come from? Um, so I'm curious what you see, how close are we to customers being really willing to not just request and demand plans and data, but start paying for lower carbon intensity products? Yeah, this is this is always the difficult question, right? Because we in this field have sold sustainability, at least the low hanging fruit on the financial wins that operational efficiency, emission reductions, renewable energy can provide. And so those still can be communicated and passed up and down the value chain in terms of, of cost savings from operations and, and energy use. But what we're talking about are the bigger transformations that lead to production that requires less energy use altogether or less water use, or it's providing new types of materials that are, you know, involving commodities that have a lower carbon intensity. And those decisions uh, sometimes do require investment uh, and maybe even initially higher costs until they can be scaled out and hopefully over time become more financially viable alternatives. Um, and th th I think that there are some customers that are that are beginning to accept that. We're at a point where I, I wouldn't say that has fully happened. And there's a few things that are holding it back and a few opportunities I think that companies are beginning to consider to incentivize that that sort of behavior. You know, I think what's holding it back in, in some cases is uh, still on the data side, you know, life cycle analysis, product level emission data, while that's a growing field in the absence of having robust data in that, in that regard, it may be sometimes difficult for a supplier to demonstrate how a sustainable alternative is actually superior in a quantitative ma uh, manner. So I think as that information becomes much clearer and easier to compare, and there's some work CDP's uh, been doing uh, around LCAs and, and product level emissions, 
Um, that will help make the business case when going to to customers. Um, so that sort of product level emissions uh, space, I think, is is really critical to to solving for that. Uh, regulation drives uh, the requirement to have those alternatives. Always is going to be important, uh, and you are seeing the beginning of that in the in in the United States. Actually, while not regulation, sort of executive orders where from the federal government, the federal buy clean initiative, you know, saying we're going to only buy certain types of steel or, or chemicals that, that meet certain requirements, those sort of things drive action in that on that side. But there are some tools that we're seeing companies employ to incentivize this type of procurement. One is carbon pricing, right? So if you build a carbon price into decision making internally, that can demonstrate how over time, if I'm saying every metric ton of carbon should be priced at $100, this potentially more expensive alternative, um, as a sustainable procurement professional, I can make a, a case that I should telling the supplier that we will actually prefer this sustainable alternative because in our projections where we're building carbon pricing, it's actually cheaper if we anticipate a carbon price coming in, in, in place. Uh, and, and so that's a, a really useful metric. The other thing we've been seeing, and it's just the beginning of it, uh, and we have a, a body of work with HSBC and Walmart on this is supplier financing. And so companies that are meeting or demonstrating better climate performance. And at this point, it's really on, a, on an enterprise level. So not necessarily on a product level, but at an enterprise level, suppliers providing better performance on climate change demonstrated through disclosure or scores would receive more favorable sort of uh, payment uh, terms, maybe not in the actual amount, but, you know, in terms of when they can get the money and access to, you know, money in advance and Walmart and HSBC sort of, you know, they're Walmart suppliers, but HSBC sort of being the financing partner there. And that work is expanding. We're, we're seeing a lot of interest in that. And I think that's where bringing in the financial community, who's also interested in decarbonization of, of sort of their portfolio, uh, getting the uh, customers who want to find ways to work with suppliers to finance these solutions and then the suppliers who want to continue to do business but also want favorable uh, payment terms. I think that's a real opportunity to, 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 to see the money actually flow favorably towards more sustainable supply chains. I love it. I love hearing that progress. And I think, you know, the companies who are responding to the questionnaire do well when they keep these sorts of things in mind, that these you know, the the increase in carbon pricing schemes at customers or even, you know, companies 10 links away in their value chain, that's going to start to let this money flow as well. That preferred pricing type setup that you mentioned with Walmart and HSBC, really interesting. And I think, you know, gives hope and, and incentive for companies to know that they're where they see opportunities to decarbonize, there will be a willingness to pay for that. Um, one other sort of future scenario that I think a lot about is, and I'm curious, Simon, to get your thoughts on this. So at Climco, as you know, we work a lot in the voluntary carbon market. We have a transactions team and a, a carbon offset project development and investment team. So we do a lot of work with companies who are heavy emitting and have the opportunity to voluntarily decarbonize. They take the step of creating a carbon offset from this voluntary action that they've taken and sort of use this voluntary market to uh, provide the capital that they need to to have taken the action and to to make this progress on decarbonization. Um, I see a future, and I'm curious, Simon, if you do too, where insetting becomes a really big driver for decarbonization. Where, you know, let's say I'm a company that operates a fleet of vehicles, then I go and look at my supply chain, and I see impacts coming from the plastic in the vehicles, from the metal from the fuels that get burned in the, the vehicles. I look at the tires and all the components that go into the tires. And then maybe I find some of the hot spots of emissions in my value chain. And I say, you know, I want to do something that's more targeted than just purchasing an offset and retiring that, which has a positive climate impact somewhere in the world. No, I want to focus on, you know, getting my scope three reductions. So can I go call the tire manufacturer and say, Hey, you know, let's let's work on some kind of decarbonization. You get a scope one and two reduction, maybe, and I get a scope three reduction. And can we sort of finance this together? Do you see, you know, I think the data will need to be a lot a lot better before those types of deals can be happening left and right. But do you see that sort of thing coming? Is it happening already? <laughs> 
Absolutely. You pointed out sort of the challenges, right, which is still getting the data right and, and making sure the credibility challenges that maybe have happened with, with some of the offsetting work aren't in place. But but many, many of the issues that, that folks have flagged with offsetting relate to, it's great that you're offsetting emissions, uh, but this uh, forest on another side of the world that you don't have any suppliers that are engaged in commodity production near that forest doesn't really relate to the emissions or the impact that you as a company are, are having. And so the opportunity to actually engage in your own value chain from a starting place really makes it a much more credible approach to to offsetting emissions. And then the fact that it's in helping finance that activity, you know, you're actually in the long term reducing your own scope three emissions while financing the company to, uh, to reduce their scope one and two makes perfect sense. You're going to see some leaders step into that place, have to deal with some of the questions that come up early on, work through those and demonstrate that this is successful, it's credible, and then a much larger uptake later, particularly because there's such a volume of companies that are setting science-based and net zero targets that require scope three emission uh, reductions. You'll start to see a number of companies who have set these targets, 2025, 2030 are coming, and the gap in terms of where those emissions are right now, where they need to be, is not closing fast enough, and creative solutions to do so need to be employed. And the insetting idea is one that could be a win-win for, for both parties, help address that issue, and lead to much quicker action than we're seeing right now to, to sort of close that emissions gap. So it's a really exciting opportunity and looking forward to more projects uh, coming online. So on that front, hopefully you will be hearing from some of our clients soon with some insetting action. You know, I think that one of the biggest things that that motivates that type of motivates company to explore that type of opportunity is that double counting is by design in scope three so there can be a whole lot of players that get involved in one deal together when they're in a shared value chain so the tire company could engage the carbon black company could engage the rubber producer could, could engage the vehicle manufacturer could engage the fleet company like all of them will share elements of the scope three such that an emission reduction in one of those nodes um, could be incentivized and sort of collaborated on from all of those people who share that scope three impact. So that's something that we see a lot of enthusiasm for. And I think we as Climco try really hard to help our companies, help our clients see that that's possible uh, because there are a lot of steps needed, a lot of data transparency, a lot of credibility that needs to happen to make it possible. Um, and I think CDP is a really wonderful platform for enabling that. And, and really quickly, just to build on the double counting piece there, sometimes that is a point of frustration for me that there's such questions or criticism. Well, is in scope three just double counting? That's the point, right? The point of scope three is double counting. And that gets back to the need for collaboration across an entire value chain. We need suppliers and customers across the value chain to work together to reduce the entire value chain emissions. And then if they're successful, they can all take credit for it because we have a decarbonized value chain. And, and this is a competitive, you know, decarbonization, climate performance, ESG, sustainability, whatever you want to call it, is a competitive field. We want companies to compete with one another. We want leaders to emerge. But ultimately, and, and particularly for CDP as a nonprofit who's who's looking for a net zero nature, po nature positive world, that competition is only from from our perspective to fuel the actual mission of of saving the planet, you know, and avoiding the most dangerous aspects of climate change. And so, you know, at the end of the day, we want companies to compete. We want them to to find ways to be winners when it comes to climate leadership. But we need to also recognize that climate leadership also involves collaboration. It also involves double counting, which means working together to reduce emissions that there is shared responsibility for. A product gets used, a consumer of that product sort of has some emissions of their own affiliate with use of the product, but the product producer who sells that product also shares some of the responsibility. And the supplier who provides the rubber that goes into the car shares some responsibility, and the rubber producer and the 
the the farmer, you know, all sort of share responsibility to reduce those emissions. And so I think that that's a really important note. And and not just reduce emissions, right, but to protect the planet from deforestation and other types of things. So I think that's the other key piece here. It's not just about the greenhouse gas emissions. It's also about the physical forests <laughs> that are being deforested to create products. How do we make sure that sort of activity is disincentivized appropriately? So this has been a wonderful conversation. I don't know if either of you have um, any other closing thoughts? I felt like that was a great way to wrap it up. But if you have any other closing thoughts, you're welcome to share. I'd be curious to ask, you know, Simon, what's coming next from CDP? I know you alluded to, you know, the, all of the expansion beyond carbon. And I know there's a lot of exciting things in the works. So that might be an interesting way to end is just what can we expect from CDP this year? You know, we've seen a lot of momentum behind the, the carbon space. But to Caitlin's point, we need to protect nature. And when you look at some of the more recent IPCC reports, or you look at the conversations at, at, at COP21 through 27, or recently COP15 in Montreal on biodiversity, there's a growing recognition that solving climate change is not just a CO2E issue. Many of the solutions are nature-based, and so we need to protect nature. In, in the process. And so CDP in recognition of that is expanding over the next couple of years to bring in sort of all of the the planetary boundaries. And, and, and the University of Stockholm produced this sort of interesting info graphic that captures where we're at when it comes to different planetary sort of boundaries, the biodiversity crisis, ocean health, plastics in the ocean, you know, non sort of organic material in the ocean and, and what that does to ocean health and the ocean, the bigger, biggest absorber of heat as we're sort of warming the planet. So recognizing that interconnected system, uh, a big driver for CDP going forward is how do we bring those topics in all in the same context of sort of, you know, the climate and, and, and our ecological sort of health as a planet and continuing to center that around financial decision making. Right. So investors, customers, suppliers. Uh, so so that's where we're headed. And, and it'll sort of still have that that basis in, in climate in, in many ways. Um, but bringing the same thought process of science based target setting, direct and indirect impacts, supply chain impacts to some of those other topics. Awesome. Thank you so much, Simon, Emily. This has been a fascinating conversation. I know our listeners are really excited to geek out on supply chains. <laughs> so uh, we really appreciate you both um, spending time with us this morning and hopefully have you on next year. We can talk about your new plastics survey, for example. I mean, there's all kinds of fun stuff happening at CDP that goes beyond our conversation. So thank you again for being with us. Thank you. Looking forward to it. This has been so nice, Simon. Love what CDP does. Thank you for spending some time with us.